Welcome to Grace Goes Deeper, a short video series for people who are exploring topics on Christianity, faith, and the Bible. In today's episode, we're going to take a look at how the Bible elevates women. One of the attacks against the Bible and Christianity is that they are sexist and oppressive toward women. That Christianity is a patriarchal system in which women are meant to submit themselves and remain quiet. But set against the backdrop of ancient history, the Bible takes a completely different approach. The Bible gives incredible value and worth to women. Let's find out how. You don't have to go far in scripture to see the value given to women. In Genesis 2, it says that God created men and women in his image. Both are a reflection of God with co-equal value and status. Some have argued that since the woman is given the title helper, that the Bible devalues her. But the Hebrew word that is used does not convey a sense of subservience, but in fact carries the meaning out of strength. It gives the idea that man needed woman because she would carry strength that he did not have himself. In fact, God is given the same title when referring to himself as a helper to Israel. The word is used 29 times in the Old Testament, and 28 of those always identify God as the helper. The word helper, then, is not an expression of submission and service to man. Instead, the woman as a helper serves God alongside man. If you contrast that with other ancient ideas about women, you would see that the Bible lays a level playing field. We are created as people in God's image, both male and female. But in Jewish, Babylonian, Assyrian, Greek, and Roman cultures, women had virtually no rights. They were second-class citizens. They were not allowed to be educated, and some didn't even consider women people, but rather possessions. The Greek philosopher Plato wrote that men were the only beings created by God and given souls, and men who were cowards were made into women in the second generation. Aristotle said, whereby that which comes into being as male is better and more divine than by the material for which is female. Appealing to different worldviews, such as naturalism and hedonism, we find that naturalism opens the door for more authority to be given to stronger men in order to take advantage of weaker women, while hedonism greatly suggests that human bodies exist only for physical pleasure and thus degrades both men and women to nothing more than objects meant to satisfy. The Jewish historian Josephus divorced his wife simply because she annoyed him. He wrote, the woman is in all things inferior to the man. Let her accordingly be submissive. The Gnostics believed that women were unfit for God and had to be turned into men to enter his kingdom. The ancient Assyrian law code said, if a man forcibly seizes and rapes a maiden who is residing in her father's house, the father of the maiden shall take the wife of the rapist of the maiden and give her over to be raped. He shall not return her to her husband. He shall take her for himself. To say the least, history has not looked favorably on women. The Bible, on the other hand, goes against the grain. Let's consider a few examples. In Genesis chapter 16, we come upon a woman named Hagar. She's an Egyptian slave who has run away out of desperation and a longing to be accepted. An angel of the Lord meets her in person at a well. After a brief exchange in which God tells her that her descendants will be multiplied and made too many to count, Hagar becomes the first person in the Bible to give a name to God. She calls him El Roy, the God who sees me. In Numbers chapter 27, we read about five daughters who had lost their father and the family is left with no male heir to keep their land. 
they go to Moses and request to keep the land themselves, which would have been culturally forbidden. Moses takes that request to God, who says, the daughters of Zelophehad are right. Give them the land. You shall speak to Israel and say that if this situation happens again, the daughters should always inherit the land. This is a statute and rule as the Lord has commanded. In an ancient culture, women were never given such authority. Then there's Rahab, who was a Gentile woman and a prostitute who became a direct ancestor of Jesus. She is mentioned in the book of Hebrews as an exemplar of faith, immediately following Abraham and Moses. Deborah was a prophetess and judge of Israel. Queen Esther, who during Israel's exile and the reign of King Xerxes, saved the people of Israel from genocide. There are many more examples in the Old Testament of heroic women who were set aside by God to uplift the Hebrew people and fulfill his purposes. This goes against the grain of all other ancient writings about women. When we come to the New Testament, we find similar stories of women who were followers of Jesus, who learned from him, sat with him, ate with him, and lent their support to his ministry. This is remarkable because at this time, women weren't allowed to be formally educated. They weren't allowed to follow and be taught by a rabbi, and yet Jesus welcomed them all with open arms. In John chapter 4, we find the story of the Samaritan woman. She was a social outcast from her community and a woman of ill repute, who became the first person to which Jesus revealed that he was the Messiah. In Luke chapter 8, we read of a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years. This has not only ostracized her from the community, but has made her ceremonially unclean and has virtually bankrupted her. When she hears Jesus is nearby, she breaks every cultural practice in order to get close enough to touch the hem of his robe. When she does, she is immediately made well. In all other circumstances, this would have landed her in a world of trouble with the authorities. Other rabbis could have had her killed but how does Jesus react? He says to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. He calls her daughter. Mary, the sister of Lazarus, comes to Jesus with a bottle of very expensive perfume and uses it to anoint Jesus's head as a symbolic gesture in advance of his coming death and burial. She was immediately rebuked and chastised by the disciples. But Jesus puts a stop to that, rebukes them for doing so, and states that wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Her actions toward the Son of God were so beautiful and noble that Jesus announces that her story is to be told alongside the gospel. Mary Magdalene was so devoted to Jesus that she was the last person at his tomb as the stone was rolled in front of it and the first person to see the stone rolled away. She was the first eyewitness of the empty tomb, the first person Jesus spoke to after he rose and the first person to be sent by Christ with the message of his resurrection. A woman was the first sent messenger of the gospel. Later, in Paul's ministry, he writes of several women who were of great importance in the early church, including Priscilla, Lydia, Junia, Persis, Julia, and Phoebe. It's certainly true that in the Old Testament, women are poorly treated. There's plenty of examples of atrocities and offenses against women. But that is because the Bible doesn't cover up the mistreatment of women, it emphasizes it. It is there to make a point. And the point is, this is wrong. 
patriarchy is wrong. This was never in God's design for the human race. Women have equal value and standing before God. Throughout scripture, we see God protecting women, providing for them, and elevating them in authority. He uses women to enable justice and hope when there is none. The women of the Bible teach us much about God's character, his work in the world, and his love for all people. In a world that will continue to be patriarchal and sexist, the Bible will always be a voice that elevates women, showing their incredible value and purpose that God has for them.